Hello and welcome to another episode of the Gritty Hour. I have a very special guest today. I have Frank Zafiro, who is a retired police officer in the state of uh, Washington. And uh, it was Washington, right, Frank? <laughs> uh, that, that's where I did my policing and grew up. Uh, moved okay. to Oregon about six years ago or so. But, I got gotcha. uh, you. Pretty much the same to everybody on the East Coast, I'm sure. Okay. Well, post-police career, uh, Frank has become a, a, an author of note. He's written several books, mainly in the in the uh, true crime genre. So uh, welcome to the Gritty Hour, Frank. It's good to have you on board. Thanks for having me. No, oh, my pleasure. Uh, so you were retired police in Spokane, and then you moved to Oregon, and now you have a little writer's nook that you're sitting in there, right? And you're, uh, you seem to be very prolific. I'll, I'll give you that. There's a lot of, <laughs> a lot of books out there. So tell me how you got uh, the transition for you. Tell me about the transition. Well, the key to the transition is it wasn't entirely a transition. Um, you know, I mean, uh, I always identified myself as a writer, kind of the same way that maybe a musician might, as a young kid, decide they're a musician. And, you know, and, and that's just always a part of their life. Um, and so uh, I wrote all you know all through school and after i graduated and went into the military and and even when i started uh, uh after i came on the job um but i did have a bit of a hiatus there after i became a police officer in 93 uh from about 95 to 04 where i just didn't really write a whole lot of fiction because i was <clears throat> i'd gone back to school full-time i was getting my undergraduate degree in history and so there's a lot of reading and writing there and I was learning a new position with the police department uh, from, you know, rookie to uh, a training officer to a corporal to a detective and sergeant. And so it was always something new. Uh, of course, there's always a lot of writing and work of that nature going on in policing as well. So there's a dry spell there fiction wise. Uh, but I really started writing pretty heavily in about 2004 when I uh, uh met another police officer and became we became pretty good friends and bonded over our, our uh, love of writing uh, mm -hmm. his name's colin conway who you know, i've written five six books with now so uh it's a pretty good partnership um and so uh, I, this is all a long way of saying that you know i retired in 2013 but i didn't retire and then start writing when i retired in 2013 i'd been writing for like publishing i guess uh you know for nine years at that point so it was more a transition into doing it full time rather than to starting it from scratch so you you were a writer disguised as a cop for 20 years <laughs> in a way you know i mean you, you kind of figure out you, you know uh hey you don't you can't just like put a sign out that says look at me mom i'm a writer and somebody just starts cutting you a check you know i mean yeah most writers have a day job and mm -hmm. and you know for me that day job uh, was either going to be teaching or, or policing. And, and really what it came down to, if I'm, if I'm being honest with, uh, the, the coin flip was that I had about a year and a half of college when, you know, when it was time to get the job and I didn't want to go, you know, another two and a half years to, uh, to get my teaching certificate, I could start working for the place as soon as I could get hired. Uh -huh. So, and I tested well and ended up high on the list. So it was a pretty sure thing and had a wife and a kid and, you know, doubled mm -hmm. my salary as soon as I got hired. It was a pretty easy decision in that regard. Yeah. And, and it's, you know, I had a great career. I, a lot of things I, I'm really glad I experienced. And when you tie it to the writing career, uh, it's, it's really been beneficial. Very good. And you served in the military. What, what branch did you serve in? Uh, I was in the U S army from oh. 1986 to 1991. Oh. Um, I was in military intelligence. I was a Czechoslovak linguist, wow. which uh, uh, technically, actually, uh, if you want to get technical, I was a spy. Um, <laughs> but uh, that sounds really awesome to some people. But the reality of it was I, I, I put on headphones like the ones you're wearing and listened to the Czech army chatter on their radios and, you know, interpreted and, you know, spied on them that way. And so uh, yeah. calling it a spy is a little, 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 a little, little more grand than what it was. <laughs> well, thank, thank you for your service, Frank. We appreciate it. Oh, thank you. Um, so uh, in addition to the writing of the books, and, you, and we're going to get to that in a minute, uh, the individual books, you also run a podcast yourself called Wrong Place, Right Crime, W-R-I-T-E, Crime. Did that evolve out of the book writing or was it concurrent? Yeah. Or? Yeah, it did. It did. I, uh, 
uh, came out of a couple of things. The first one really was that a writer buddy of mine who I uh, wrote several books with, a three, a three book series uh, named Eric Beatner, him and another guy, uh, S.W. Loudon, they, uh, uh, they, they put out a podcast called Writer Types, which it's still available. You know, it's an evergreen thing, the podcast, as you well know. Mm-hmm. And Writer Types is a fantastic podcast and and the two of them are pretty funny and it's just really well produced uh eric's job is a uh he you know he's an editor in the television field and so you know it's just really well well cut together too Uh and i got to enjoying what they're doing i was like wow that sounds like a lot of fun you know talking to these other authors and then the other piece that came up was you know they're promoting other authors they're giving back to the community the writing community they're helping out their fellow writers and I always felt like, and and I know Eric and and Steve felt this way too, which is why they did the podcast. It's not a zero sum game in this field. Like you know, if you and I are competing over somebody buying a used car, it kind of is a zero sum game. They're not going to buy both cars. But if you and I both wrote a book, there's a better than middle and chance that the person might decide to read both. You know, and and just because they pick yours doesn't mean they can't pick mine too, and vice versa. So promoting your fellow writers is, you know, you're not cutting your own throat by doing that. And so, you you know, you can feel good about it. Uh And uh, so those two things kind of came together to make me decide to take a stab at it. But I couldn't do like Eric and and Steve were doing because they're funny and they had a partnership going and everything. And so they had like this AM uh, morning drive kind of vibe. You know what I'm talking about? You know, yeah. short punchy segments and a lot of humor and everything. I decided to go the other route. I went with the, uh, 2 AM on a long stretch of highway Two people talking about ostensibly whatever the guest is an expert in, but long ranging conversations from there, uh-huh. something to keep you company on that overnight drive when you're, you know, nothing but the radio towers to keep you company sort of thing. And, right. and, uh, that's, that's what kicked it off, uh, 160 episodes ago. Oh, very good. I, I did check out a couple of them and, and you do bring on authors. Um, they seem, at least the ones I checked out seem to be writing in the same genre that you write in the crime, true crime. And in that sense, to what, to your point, it, it makes perfect sense. Someone that's mm-hmm. interested in that kind of, uh, novel, you know, it's, it's a self-serving thing in addition to promoting someone else. Yeah. I would say probably a good 70% of the writers I bring on are, uh, of the guests I bring on are crime fiction authors in my general genre. But I mean, I've had cozy authors on too, which is completely out of my wheelhouse. And, and I've tried to throw a few curveballs every once in a while. I brought on, the. uh, one of the best interviews I had was with the uh, humorist uh, Christopher Moore, um, but uh, but there's a little bit of a tie in there too, though, because he had the, his book Noir was coming out, which you know kind of makes fun of those old '40s noir movies, and so right. even there there's a tie in there too. But uh, it's been really great. I mean, I'm sure you experience it as well. You get a chance to to meet people you may never have met, uh, or bring your buddies on and. and, and push them you know and, this is the and, case in uh, point is tonight i get to meet a a, mm-hmm. a gentleman from from oregon which i would never do in my daily life so it's the it's the uh it's the underlying reason why i think most people do a podcast you know so you're right um so when when you do the right place uh excuse me the wrong place right crime podcast um when you bring an author on, what do you generally do? You, you're just promoting them, or do you get into a uh, discussion about your style versus theirs or their writing style and that kind of stuff? I made a decision really early on that the the focus of the show was always, at least during the interview for sure, going to be on the author. And so um, I, I keep the spotlight on them as much as possible. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I mean, I'm not afraid to to, to be there with them for a minute or two to, to, you know, if the conversation goes that way, but, you know, I edit it, I don't do it live. And so I, I can tell you that a, a large swaths of my own rambling gets uh, snipped out often, you know, it may have moved the conversation in a direction that worked, but it, it, you don't need to hear me say all that stuff. And right, right, right. so I pretty liberally cut my, my own chatter. 
uh, because the purpose is to, to promote that author. And sometimes it's because they have a new book coming out. You know, I mean, uh -huh. sometimes it's just to, to you know, my, my, my ultimate goal would be that there's somebody listening who either A, really likes that author and wants to hear a little inside baseball about them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, how they came up with a character or what's the next book they're going to do or something like that. Or they uh, discover someone they've never heard of before. And then maybe they're like, Hey, I'm going to check that person out. And it mm -hmm. turns out they've just discovered their, their newest favorite author. And yeah. if either one of those things happens, I think that's a huge win. Oh, absolutely. And um, actually, while we continue this conversation, I usually say this when I have an author on, uh, Frank's uh, website will be in the show notes just below, and also a uh, link to his podcast will be in the show notes just below. And uh, speaking of the website, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share that for people to see that are watching us on YouTube, uh, to see your, um, your website. And then I want to discuss some of the books you've written. Um, I kind of have a guess as to where you get your inspiration from, but maybe you can describe to us, uh, cause you are a very prolific writer and I just wanted to know where you get your inspiration from essentially. Yeah. I was just updating my writing credits to have, you know, something you want to have ready. If, if somebody asked for your CV and I hadn't updated it in quite some time. And if I include books under both my pen name and my real name, I, uh, I'll be at 39 novels in uh, in june wow the two june releases so um that's not bad i, I mean i was taught told my wife you know i mean if you had told me 25 years ago that at, at this age i'd be sitting on almost 40 novels uh and and continuing to put out new ones then i'd, I'd be pretty thrilled with that um but this is my flagship series you're looking at here my main series uh, that book under a raging moon was mm -hmm. my very first book um and and since it's the first book it's one of those things like uh it has a special place in your heart and you're also mildly embarrassed about it because it's <laughs> probably your weakest work um <laughs> you know but uh river city is a very thinly veiled spokane uh, part of the reason i used a pen name and and part of the reason why i used river city instead of spokane was to put a little distance between myself and and my reality when i was was still on the job mm -hmm. just a little bit of of being careful there um but you can see some of these covers are uh you know especially that first one that's uh, an iconic bridge in river city or, or in spokane rather mm -hmm. uh that's the monroe, monroe street bridge and um so uh, uh you know a lot of them have those those kind of, of cityscape covers and, and River City is basically, I mean, depending on what age you are, you'll you'll attach to one of these shows or the other. A lot of people have compared it to Hill Street Blues or NYPD Blue, or if you're a little newer to the game, uh, Southland is a pretty good example. Mm -hmm. And it, and by that, I mean, it's an ensemble cast of, of police officers uh, and eventually detectives and, and even eventually the leadership uh, members. Uh, and and you get the third person view, so it jumps around from character to character to a degree. Um, but there are some core characters that get more time. And you can see here in the first paragraph um, of, of in the first book, you've got uh, Stefan Copriva, uh, the young hotshot. He, I thought he was going to be the star of the series. Uh, turned out I was wrong. Um, uh, but... Uh, uh, then you got the veteran Carl Winter, who's about to retire, and then uh, Tom Chisholm, who is kind of the—he's the—he's the sage officer. He's the one who everybody respects, and he—he he has all the wisdom and institutional knowledge. And uh, if people are trying to figure out what a good patrol cop looks like, that's the model that they that they pick. Right. Um, now, who isn't listed here in this first book, uh, but is in the book, is a, a uh, an officer named Katie McLeod. And um, she has kind of a support role in this book and a little bigger role in the next book. But by the third book, if you scroll down to the bottom of this page here, you'll, you'll see the, the next book in the series. And I, I, I think I changed it towards just the next one. Yeah, um, the, uh, the third book, Beneath a Weeping Sky, Katie becomes the core 
at least the emotional core of the series and and uh book eight will come out later this summer and i would say that's still the case so is she is she a police officer in the book yeah she's a patrol officer at the beginning uh uh uh, she's a peer of uh of copriva Uh um same you know three years on when the when the when the series starts and uh people age in in you know as time passes their their roles change i mean uh spoiler alert but uh as the this eighth book comes out you know katie's in the detective's office now and so you see the progression of people's careers and people leave the job and new people come on but it's a slow process i mean you don't get attached to someone and they're gone in the next book you know for the most part it's it's over the course of books that things change and my goal really with this series when i first started it and it, it remains the case was i wanted to show police officers in a you know i wanted to show the humanity of the officers i mean uh a lot of people they see the badge they see the uniform they see all the tools uh, or they see the headlines um, and they never really see the individual that's wearing that badge or, or that uniform and and so i wanted to show some of that i wanted to show the world through the eyes of these officers and what what they go through what they deal with why they deal with things a certain way and, and so forth because it is a procedural it does delve into the whys and the hows a lot but I wasn't going to make them, you know, Dudley do rights or, or whatever. I mean, they make mistakes and they have frustrations and they, uh, they, they are not perfect. They fail sometimes because nobody is, is always, nobody's perfect. Mm -hmm. Uh, and neither are they, um, but they're not, you know, they're, they're imperfect because they stumbled and failed, not because of any malice or, or, or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, that, and so that's kind of the deal with that series, and it's been uh, uh, it's been a nice it's been a nice long ride with it. Uh, uh, I've, I've I've enjoyed it, and I've got a, a pretty good arc planned out over the next few years with it. Uh, with some, you gonna some stick with the River City series? Things. You gonna stick with the River City series? Yeah, yeah. I don't think it's. I think uh, I would guess another six or seven books at least. Wow. Uh, before I, I think about whether to maybe give it a rest for a while. Mm-hmm. I have a destination in mind for a couple of the characters that I definitely want to see them get to. The other thing I've done with this series is there's, there's seven of them out now that are in the series proper. Um, but there are, if you, if you go up to the top there and click on novels again, right there next to home, just, yeah, just mm-hmm. click on, on the, the novels there. Uh, and, oh, you, and there, you wanna, there you go. Yeah. We, yeah. We, it'll, it'll take you to, no, don't go down. Just click on that. There you go. Now, now scroll down uh, the page itself, not the menu. Oh, you want to click on novels. Yeah. 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 You you already did it. Just go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You're good. Sorry about that. Okay. So no, you're okay. So here's the, here's the city, the river city series proper. And there's an eighth one coming out. uh, The the worst kind of truth will be out this summer. But if you scroll down near to the bottom of the page, you will also see um, uh, what I call river city standalones. And those are books that take place in the River City universe. Um, and there we go. Uh-huh. There they are. So all three of these books take place in River City with River City characters. They're canon, if you will. They're part of the timeline. But they take place outside of the strict timeline. In other words, River City started in 1994. The new book is is in 2008. But these take place in uh, 2014, 2010, 2005, respectively, if you're going from left to right. So, I, you know, as I write these other books and and move the main series along, if a good story comes along that's outside that time, rigid timeline, I can always do this. I can always jump in and, and, and tell a standalone that's still set in the River City world. Uh, are uh, the characters and, similar or the, is it the same? It's not the same. Yeah. Yeah. same the same police officers involved yep oh yeah. i see in okay. some cases in some cases they're further along in their career like in the middle one chisholm's debt you know chisholm is that thomas chisholm is that uh you know that sage officer i mentioned in the first book and he's like a 14 year vet at the time and in this book here it takes place after he retires and oh. he doesn't retire until the uh, end of the seventh book um in the regular series in the in the main series if you will uh, so I don't know if this is making sense timeline wise, but you know, the main series is very strictly chronological. These kind of take place outside of that, but they're 
part of the series uh, universe. So your your fans that are following following the River City uh, uh, as they come out, as you said, the eighth book will be out in a couple of months. They can refer to the standalone ones while they're waiting for the for the next one. Yeah, well, yeah. And, and they'll run into a few spoilers, but nothing nothing that's going to rock their socks. I mean, nothing that they're going to be like, oh my gosh, you know, that, that ruins the, the whole rest, rest of the series for me or whatever. I mean, there no, no huge spoilers. Mm. I, uh, I was fortunate you have, you were gracious enough to send me a, uh, novella, a novella about, uh, the robbery of a, um, uh, of a, uh, a mummy, uh-huh. which I the found very mummy. interesting. Yeah. And <laughs> I, I got a good glimpse of the, your writing style and you do, you do write down to earth, which I, I enjoy. Uh, I enjoy that. Um, when you develop a character, like say you mentioned that that uh, police officer, the female police officer, uh, do you do, does does the character you develop then dictate what happens to them? I, I, this is a, just a writer's oh, yeah. a writer's question. Um, do you let that decide what happens to them? You kind of have to, I think, mm-hmm. um, if you've if you've been honest in creating or understanding that character, however you want to put it, um, if you try to shoehorn that character into activities or behaviors or choices that he or she wouldn't actually make, they fight back and they mm-hmm. it doesn't work. And if you don't catch it, your beta readers or your editors will for sure. Mm-hmm. Um and so, yeah, I've had to, I've had to quite a few times decide that the nice little plot twist I wanted isn't necessarily going to work because, you know, Katie's too smart for that or, you know, uh, whatever the case mm-hmm. may be that it just, you know, like you said, you, they, they kind of start to dictate their own paths to a degree. Right. Um, tell me a little bit that's, uh, about this Charlie 316 series. Oh, this is a cool series. It's also a procedural series. Uh, my buddy Colin, uh, we like I said, we wrote that book, uh, uh, Some Degree of Murder, one of the standalone uh, River City books together. And, uh, you know, way back in like 2005 and, and back around 2017 or 18, he, he, you know, we'd been exchanging our work, you know, editing for each other, reading each other's stuff and continuing to encourage each other uh mm-hmm. in our careers and he reaches out to me and he says hey i've got this great idea for a book but i kind of want you to come in on it with me because it you know it's about this police officer who's kind of a golden child of the department and he gets in a shooting that looks bad and and i, I want to explore what happens like will the city hang him out to dry uh for political reasons or what you know i want to i want to explore that i think it's it's relevant today and it'd be it'll be interesting but uh, you know he was a cop too for five years but his role in the police department was he was a patrol officer and then he moved into a uh, kind of a bureaucratic position working with uh, businesses and licensing and stuff uh, around the city and then at the end of his career he became the union president which broke him he 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 did not enjoy that experience at all and in fact that's what when he left the job he went back into real estate where he's been very successful Uh and he said you know i I don't want to get over my skis on the kind of stuff that happens uh, in an officer involved shooting at the higher levels of the police department, because I, I'd been a captain. I, uh, been in those rooms and, you know, seen those, uh, the politics and so forth. So he wanted to work on it with, he wanted me to work on it with him. So I, I was like, it sounds like a great story. Let's go to work. So we had just, he had this skeleton of a story. We hung all the meat and skin on it, started rounding it out, uh, you know, figured out what our, what our writing process was going to be and we knocked it out really fast and it was some of the best work i think that either of us had done um and at the end of the book we're like wow uh i think i just realized something this story is not over like it's over but it, the, the the arc isn't over so these first four books uh charlie 316 never the crime badge heavy and code four we call that the Tyler Garrett arc because it kind of follows the arc of this character, the officer I mentioned at the beginning, um, through uh, through what happens to him. I mean, in the first book, 
the first chapter, the first book, it's no spoiler here. He gets in the shooting that I mentioned, but there's a few things that are different than your average shooting. Um, for one thing that it, it's a traffic stop that occurs when the, sh and then the, then the shooting happens on a traffic stop, but there's no gun found at the scene. Uh, and the victim is, is struck in the back by the bullets, the motorist, the suspect, whatever you want to label him. Um, and so that's a problem. Um, and then, you know, in, in, the, in the policing world, you see a lot of controversial shootings that tend to be a white officer and a black suspect. And in this case, in Spokane, which is about 87% white, I think, we have a black officer and a white victim suspect, however you want to label him. So we kind of flipped the script a little bit on that as well. And immediately after the shooting, things just go haywire all up and down the spectrum, you know, from, from police uh, uh, leadership to city hall, to the media, to the officer himself, to the investigators that have to do the investigation from the other, uh, from the county sheriff's office, the outside organization, uh, to the police detective from the the Spokane PD who's assigned to shadow those detectives to follow their investigation and kind of look out for the interests of, of the police department. And uh, that's detective Wardell Clint, who's a rather prickly individual. His nickname is honey badger. So you can imagine how well he gets along with his coworkers. <laughs> uh, and, and it goes from there. So that is a four book arc. The ride along is the book. It just came out in May. Uh, and, and, and after we finish this four book arc, now this, the books that are coming out in this series, they're still in the, in the universe. They're still happening subsequent to the events of the first four books, but they also stand alone a little more. And in, in the ride along, you have a, a police reform activist who's a teacher who gets a ride along with the police department, which means she's going to ride with a police officer in a patrol car for 10 hours she's put in a car with a third generation cop who's a just a true blue you know bleeds blue uh, officer he's a good cop a good guy but the two of them have very different views on contemporary policing how and what might need to change uh how to interpret everything surrounding the topic and because of this sparks fly in the in the patrol cruiser uh, not of the romantic kind and uh, uh, eventually they reach a little bit of a, of a truce in which they're able to exchange some ideas and even listen to each other a little bit. It's no kumbaya story by any stretch, but it was born out of my frustration that a lot of people in the public don't understand policing, but make a lot of judgments in any way. And since I retired almost a decade ago, I also see some some things that we in law enforcement don't do ourselves any favor and need to do much better at. And in both instances, people were, you know, yelling slogans and, you know, trying to say their piece, but not doing a lot of listening to the other view or or trying to understand where maybe the middle ground was. Right. And since nobody was listening, I put two people in a position where they had to listen to each other. And uh and I made sure that neither one is a straw person here. They, they, they both get an equal chance to speak their truths, to listen to the other person. I try to be, uh, both Colin and I try to be very uh, even handed in, in, in presenting the characters so that wherever you are on this subject, whatever you believe or think, you should encounter times in this book where you go, yes, I'm glad that point got made. And you should come across some moments where you go, no, that's ridiculous. I totally disagree. And hopefully a few moments where you go, huh, I, you know, I've never really thought about it that way before. Or I didn't realize that, or I'm going to need to think about that for a second. And if we can get people to do that a little bit, then maybe we nudge the conversation just an inkling, you know, uh, in the right direction. Right. I, I, I was going to ask you a question about uh, developing a whole new set of characters and how, to, how that affects you as the writer. But now you got me wanting, wondering, uh, when, do, when you're doing the ride along, who, uh, who the points of view, I guess, are being expressed during the during the book. And did you write both ends of that point of view? Did you explore both points of view? I did. Um, how I did, did that... the first four books the way I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say, how did you do it? <laughs> well, the first four books, you know, Colin and I, 
outlined them together, we brainstormed them together, and we rewrote them together. We tended to each pick a certain few characters, and we would write those characters um, with a few that we both wrote, just depending on on convenience. But it was pretty equal. When I came up with the idea for a ride along, it was initially a short story idea. I just thought it would be a short story, and then I realized it was too big of a topic, and decided to make it a novel. And I was halfway through it when I. I had yet to put it in an actual location. It was in any town USA, right? Mm -hmm. And I came to realize that it didn't have the impact only talking about the national concepts, this event in Cleveland or that event in New York or this event in Los Angeles. It didn't have the same bite because nothing was happening in the local community. And so I knew I had to place it in a real place. And, um, and it's a, I could take you through the whole process, but the, 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 the upshot of it is I realized that, that the Charlie 316 version of Spokane was the right place to put it. So I chatted with Colin about it and he said, let's do it, but this is a little different. So why don't you just finish the first draft and then we'll, we'll do the editing the way we normally do, which is we both edit viciously and, and <laughs> we, you know, knock it back and forth till we're both happy with it. And it's no hold barred, no holds barred. Um, so I did, I wrote the whole first draft and the way I approached it to answer your, your second part of your question there, it was easy for me on the police side because I had, I'd experienced most of what Lee Salter, the officer is experiencing the thoughts, the, the frustrations. Right. Um, and so for me, that was just a matter of thinking about it and remembering and, and I, and I have friends that are still on the job or are also retired that I've known well. And so I did mine a few of them with with some thoughts to make sure I, I wasn't completely out of touch, having been retired for for you know almost a decade. Um, but it's that time of having been retired for almost a decade that gave me some insight into the other side of the coin, into the the, the police reform activist side of it. Right. Um, I mean, I'd heard all those arguments. I'd been in those discussions with folks. I've I've considered some of the things that they've talked about and actually agree with some of them. I do think that we, we do need to re reform policing. It's uh, not as radically as some people are, are opining, but definitely some of the suggestions I've heard are, I think are good ones. And so I did the research on, on, on what I didn't already know about. And I just really, I, I promised myself it was gonna be a 50-50 deal. So when I was writing Melody, I was on her side 100%. I believed everything she believed. And in those scenes, I presented it with that level of conviction. When I wrote Lee, I did the same thing for him. And getting into the skin of, of whichever, you know, whoever's chapter it was, because the chapters alternate back and forth viewpoint wise. Uh, and that's, you know, and then the, the editing process came came with, with Colin and he was able to call me out on where maybe I had, you know, lean too far one way or the other with a, with with a character or with a scene, uh -huh. and he, he helped me find that balance. And I'm and I'm not going to sit here and tell you it's truly fifty fifty because, like everybody, I have my biases. So I'm sure even if I was trying not to, uh, you know, you don't have a twenty year career in law enforcement and not come down at least slightly biased towards law enforcement. So mm -hmm. you know, if it's fifty one forty nine, I was willing to live with that. The worst criticism I've heard so far in terms of 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 that. Uh, one of the readers told me he thought it was about 60, 40. So, uh, you know, I can live with that even, you know, I mean, if, if I have to, so. Mm -hmm. But that's interesting. And it's a, certainly a, an interesting approach, which brings me to my next question. The other four that you did, uh, you had mentioned prior that uh, Mr. Conway and yourself break up characters. In other words, Mr. Mm -hmm. Conway will write some characters. You'll write some characters. Mm -hmm. How do you mesh them together? Like say, say say two of the characters are you and I and we're conversing right now. How mm -hmm. do you mesh that together in the in the editing process? Yeah, that's where it does get meshed together because I might be writing the chapters from Wardell Clint's point of view, but Wardell Clint is going to be in some chapters that, that Colin's writing, right? That mm -hmm. that are from the point of view of characters that he he's writing. And, and so it is in the editing that that is, is, uh, is, is fixed. And so really what it comes down to is you kind of get to be the warden of your own characters, true North a little bit. So if you're editing, if you wrote a chapter that contained the character that I wrote and I felt like you were off in the way he was responding or she was acting, then I, you know, Colin and I both gave each other 
100% veto, 100% heavy handed editing power. You go in and fix it. And then I send it back to you and you look at it and you're like, oh, that looks fixed to me. Or you say, uh, no, I didn't. And you, know, and you start batting it back and forth until you get total agreement. But with, with having that ability to, you know, say anything, change anything, address anything, um, you know, nothing goes unchallenged. So the characters end up remaining true to themselves. Interesting. Because I, uh, that novella I read of yours, uh, there's a lot of incidental conversation that happens. Like there was a point in that novella where one guy said, I watched it on the History Channel or, or something to that effect. Who who controls the incidental conversations that happen? Because that mm -hmm. is part of your style. I don't know if it's part of Mr. Mm -hmm. Conway's style, but um, you know, we have similar but not the same styles. Uh, I'm a little more verbose than he is, I think, mm -hmm. um, which should be shocking to anybody that's been watching this uh, podcast. I'm sure <laughs> um, uh, he's a lot better at uh, at getting straight to the point sometimes too much so just like i sometimes go on too long so so we help each other out in that regard you know the incidental conversations most of the time it's the responsibility of who whoever's writing that that chapter um but when you go through the editing process sometimes you'll see an opportunity to slide a comment in or you know a, a quick exchange or a behavior or something that really helps bring home the characterization of that person um, and you just you, you put it in there and, and let the other guy see it. And, and if he recognizes it for what it is, then great. You you move on. And if if you disagree, you chat about why. And I got to tell you, I mean, we've written six books together, five in this series. We've had some heated conversations. And I, by heated, I don't mean angry, but I do mean like we both really believed in what we were saying and they weren't the same thing. So we've had these strident conversations a few times, not very often, um, but we've never been unable to resolve them. And mm. and one or the other of us is always able to to recognize ultimately who's right. <laughs> you know, and sometimes it's him, and sometimes it's me. And the it, it's all about putting your ego aside and doing what's best for the book, and then and and also trusting your partner. It's like a marriage in a way. I mean, if you know your partner um, has your best and the book's best interests at heart, and that's what's motivating him, then the only conflict is conceptual, the idea. I don't agree with the idea that you're stating, and that's it. There's no ulterior motive to consider. There's none of that comes into play. It's a, you know, it's one dimension of argument. Uh, uh, because you trust the person and, you know, and that makes a huge difference in other human relations. You know, you always have the surface argument, but you have all the ulterior considerations and all these other things that come into play that kind of muddy the waters. And we don't have that, um, uh -huh. in, in, in our, in our writing collaboration at all. Um, and, and that trust really goes a long way, I think, towards helping us get to the very best version of what we're trying, what we're trying to create. Right. So he might come to you and say, you know, what the hell is this guy doing at a Seattle Mariners game? This character would never go to a Seattle Mariners game. I'll, I'll give you a real life example in this book, The Ride Along. It just came out. When I sent him the first draft, um, I'd already let my wife read it because um, of timing issues. He wasn't ready for it yet. So I, I mean, I let her read it because she was going to read it anyway. And she came back and she was like, I love Lee. He's great. I, I, I don't like Melody. She's this and that. But uh you know, I thought Lee was great. I send it to Colin. He comes back and he's like, uh, I hate Lee. I hate the officer in this book. <laughs> I, mean, I hate him, but you know, I mean, shorthand for, for, for there's problems with him. I'm like, Oh, wow. What's that? We can't have that. You can't, you have to at least respect both of them and hopefully like both of them as people at, at some level for this to work. And he said, he's, he's, uh, uh, how did he, Oh, what did he call it? He called it, uh, 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 thin skinned salter. He said, uh, he's being whiny about everything. He's like this, everything this woman says, he's got like thin skin. He's getting upset. He's calling his sergeant. He's reacting to, he's not being very professional. And, and I, I had wanted to show how hard it is to have somebody sitting in your car, criticizing you doing your job. And, Cause it is, but, uh, I way over shot, you know? And so mm -hmm. he reeled me back in. He said, no, you can't, you can't have that. 
or people are going to all side except for the extreme cop lovers or there everybody's going to side with this ride along and you won't we won't accomplish the goal here which is even handedness which is to present both ideas uh in an even way uh and you, so you reeled it in and and you know saved the book in in that regard um and and i've done that for him in a couple of of his solo works and we we uh you know and it's all because like i said we both know the other guy has our it, it, we i got your back you know i'm doing this because i don't want you to walk out in public with your zipper down and and your your shirt untucked you know and mm-hmm. and uh, it's not about let me show you how much smarter i am or how much better of a writer i am than you and i'll lord this over you that i found a mistake in your manuscript or some you know crap like that it's it's a true you know caring partnership and so i, I feel pretty lucky that that you know that we've uh, been able to do this for five books now and at least one more that we're going to do it sounds like a productive and uh you know it sounds like a very good partnership that you have there um now you did some other series i i was looking at this earlier today with some other writers Mm -hmm. eric beatner now this seems like it because i haven't read the the brick and cam jobs uh series it seems like it might be completely different from your normal genre I would say uh, somewhat different. Yeah. Um, Eric is the guy I mentioned before who had the podcast uh, that, mm-hmm. that kind of inspired me. One of the all time greatest guys in crime fiction. I love him. Uh, just a, a super nice guy. One of the cleanest first draft authors I've ever known. Um, and, and I highly, highly recommend if you, if you like fast moving action, uh, in your crime fiction, then check out Eric Beatner. He's got a, a slew of books and they're all good. Um, funny thing. I, I had written, uh, I'd written this series with that's below that, the Anya series with, uh-huh. with, uh, Jim Wilski. I'd written with Colin and yeah. I kept bothering Eric. I was like, Hey, let's write up, let's write together sometime, man. Let's write together sometime. And he kept putting me off, you know, he's kind of keeping me at arm's length and I was almost turning into a stalker about it, you know? <laughs> um, and, and he said, look, hey, it's not you, you know, it's not you, it's me, you know, mm-hmm. but he was like, hey, it's not you. I, I, I did it with, with one time already. I had a collaboration experiment. It went really well. I, I, I totally beat the odds. I don't see that lottery ticket hitting again. So I don't want to risk screwing up a good friendship by working together. And I was like, that's not going to happen. And, you know, and, and I mean, but you know, he, he didn't want to do it. Finally, you know, I'm talking three, four years. I hit him up every once in a while about it. Finally, I, I, I can't remember if I said something to him that spurred it or if he just came out of the blue with it, but he finally said to me, you know what? I got this idea. What if there was like, what if the mafia had to downsize? And so they gave like a couple of competing lists to these two different hit men that didn't know each other and whoever did the best job gets to keep the job. And the other one is out of work. Mm-hmm. And I was like, so is it a comedy? He goes, nah, it's an action with some dark comedy in it. And I said, I'm on board. Let's do it. Mm-hmm. And so uh, I wrote the character of uh, Paula Bricky Bricks. Mm-hmm. And and she's kind of a sharp tongued, uh, uh, pretty world, world weary, uh, cynical person whose dad worked for the mafia so she's a legacy hire i guess Mm. and uh he wrote cam uh, cameron who is trying to break into the business and he's kind of a uh he creates mayhem like his nickname eventually becomes slaughterhouse because you know he could go buy a stick of bubble gum and the store would explode i mean that's kind of what happens with him (laughs) and so they both like i said they get these competing lists of outstanding accounts and they have to try to you know beat the other person and of course they eventually become aware of each other and things uh they don't get romantic so don't get your hopes up but they do become partners and 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 things went on for a total of three books there and it was a lot of fun um like i said some dark comedy um my comedy was more sarcasm and 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 things bricks would say uh eric's comedy tended to be gross things that happen <laughs> and he went he won the gross out award in all three books hands down i think <laughs> um i won't give you any spoilers but trust me and if you're reading the cam chapters that's where you're gonna that's where you're gonna land on that's cool on the gross out award for each book and what about the Anya series what's the gist 
uh, those are more your hard boiled, almost noir series. Um, the first one, uh, all of them, much like Brooks and Cam, they're, they're uh, two characters in each book. Uh, in, in these books, it's two different main characters each time. I wrote one, Jim wrote the other. And we wrote it in the alternating chapter uh, sort of format with uh, both of them being in the first person. It's the same thing with the Brooks and Cam jobs. And in the first one, you got a couple of brothers, uh, uh, Mick and Jersey, who are their half brothers and on their their dad's in prison and on his deathbed, he, he tells them about a, a job he pulled that uh, not all the diamonds got uh, recovered. And that sends them kind of on a quest to recover these diamonds, but they're also trying to sabotage each, each other a little bit, uh, mm. sort of a uh Cain and Abel meet the Hardy Boys I guess uh you know sort of thing meet Breaking Bad type of deal mm -hmm. um and along the way you can see the blonde in the background there they one of them and eventually both of them meet this femme fatale named Anya and she was just a character that Jim introduced early on in the book and you talk about you know characters kind of dictating their own path she suddenly exploded into you know, it became a three-person book, even though she didn't have any POV chapters. Um, and ultimately, she became the through thread of the entire series, because as the series continues in each of the following three books, you have two different characters that each of us narrated, but Anya is the third character uh, through all of them. Um, and so it's, it's uh, like I said, it's hard-boiled, uh, leaning towards noir at times. Uh, the, the last book there is the prequel, kind of an origin story for Anya. Jim Har and I Harbinger? Don't agree. Harbinger? Yeah, Harbinger. Okay. Uh -huh. um, we disagree on, like I say, this is the order you should read them in. That's why I put them in this order on my website. <laughs> <laughs> I think that the the reveals in the in Harbinger that, get, that tell you about the origin story of Anya pack a pretty big punch after you've read the first three books. Uh, ah. Jim is in favor of reading it first, so... And it works either way. It's really up to the reader, but this is the way I would I would go about it. It's like The Godfather. Can you can you watch Godfather two before for, for one? Yeah, uh, not the Michael sections. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So now I, I have to ask you about some of these other series. I, I'm I'm enthralled about. Uh, this seems to be a wide range, but they all have a, like an underlying theme. So the Spoke Compton series. Yeah. So S Spokane. Um, it has many nicknames. Uh, officially, it's the Lilac City, the Lilac City, um, you know, Spokaloo and, you know, all kinds of different things people call it. But one of the things that they have called it in, in years past is Spokompton because uh, the crime rate was pretty rough for a little while. And also there was a, a, a bit of a migration from Compton, California to Spokane during the crack epidemic. In the 90s um, yeah. in, in, in the 90s yeah and so um so the spoke Compton series is you know it, if you look at the top of my website the, the tagline there is gritty crime fiction from both sides of the badge well this is the underside of the badge this is the, the flip side of things all of these books i'm working on the fourth one right now actually um they're from the criminal side of things um, not the cop side. I mean, the cops aren't necessarily bad in these books, but from the view of the protagonists, uh, they're the bad guys. And uh, uh, they're not the same character in each book. They they kind of all stand alone, but there are recurring and overlapping characters and storylines. So All from the um, criminal's point of view? All of them are from the criminal's point of view, yeah. Mm. Um, I've had this called by some people kind of as a, a, a geographic series. They all take place in the same place and the same people kind of pop in and out of the stories, but somebody different is the center point of, of each book. Mm -hmm. um, and and they're a lot of fun because, you know, I mean, I, I've, I've explored the police experience a lot in my writing career and I enjoy that for a variety of reasons, but it's kind of cool to, you know, to to put on the dirty clothes and, and go, go in the dark alleys. Get on the while. other side for a little bit. Yeah. 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 And, and the Jack McRae, uh, ser uh mysteries. These are uh, kind of like the Copriva mystery series. These are private detective series. Ah, although they're, although they're not like, neither of them are licensed PIs, 
but that's the subgenre that they would go in private investigator. Uh, Jack McCray is a, uh, uh, police detective. He retires at about 57. Um, he's had kind of a mediocre, unremarkable career. And, uh, the tagline for the series is, you know, uh, first Jack McCray retired, then things got interesting. Um, <laughs> you know, he, he ends up, uh, in that first book, he, uh, he is approached by a woman who is actually the daughter of a woman that he was involved with many, many years ago. I mean, she was like 10 and now she's 30. So, you know, 30 something. So over 20 years ago and uh, his, you know, but he, he lived with her for about a year uh, and it didn't work out. And now uh, her mother's died and she discovered a photograph of a little girl about four or five years old sitting on her mother's lap that is very obviously her daughter i mean the the you know it's too too much of a of a uh, coincidence yeah. they, they look too much alike you know mm. they, the, the resemblance is just you know stuck. but nobody knows anything about this or nobody will tell her anything about this and so she wants to find out about this this sister she didn't know she ever had and uh she goes to to jack or to mac because uh when you do a little cocktail napkin math it could be his kid Mm. And she needs some expertise because she's getting, uh, she's running into roadblocks everywhere she goes trying to ask questions. So he accompanies her down to a small town in, in Oregon uh, uh, that is kind of ruled by the, the family that's uh, kind of small town politics is what he runs into. And they try to find this little girl. Mm. Um, and then uh, the rest of the series, you know, is, is things happening to him. And the second one here, it'll be out next month. Uh, you know, it's quite a few years later and his mentor has died and his mentor's son comes to him with a letter that he found in which his mentor confesses seemingly to doing something wrong, but he's a little vague about it. And uh, his son wants to know what it was. And so now Mac has to find out who, what his hero did wrong. Mm. And it, it, it jumps off from there. Uh, Everything you're describing so far I, I can't wait to see it on Netflix. <laughs> um, I would like that. Yeah, because it's very uh, descriptive and, it, and you know it's, it's it gets you involved. Uh, so um, Lawrence Kelter, well, with Lawrence Kelter series. Yeah, l yeah. Larry Kelter is uh, a New York based uh, writer. Um, mm -hmm. He's he's got uh, probably his flagship series is his Stephanie Chalisi thrillers. Um, but he's written a bunch of other stuff. Actually, as a quick side note, he he's written the novelization of the My Cousin Vinny um, oh. and a couple of a couple of authorized sequels to that. So if people liked that movie and those characters, there there's some books uh, that uh, are the, the are based very closely on the original character and the script. Um, Interesting. He he collaborated on it uh, with the screenwriter uh, that, that wrote the movie. Um, and he, he came to me, this first book, The Last Caller, he came to me and said, hey, I want to write, I want to write a procedural and I, I want to write with you um, because I want someone who's done the job and I want that kind of, uh, you know, that authenticity uh, to, to the, to this story. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, well, here's, here's how I've been doing it. You know, we'll write first person, two characters back and forth. And this is how, you know, I've done it in the past. And he's like, yeah, I don't really want to do it that way. <laughs> try. So let's try one character. And I was a little worried about it, to be honest with you, because, you know, when you're writing two different characters in alternating chapters, it's okay that they sound completely different. In fact, it's probably what you want, right? It's you want beneficial. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. It's the whole point. I was worried that we'd have a schizophrenic sounding main character, you know? And, uh, but I was like, ah, I'll give it a try. You never know. So we came up with the, the storyline and we started writing this and, you know, we write one, two, three chapters, whatever. We take it to a certain point and pass it back and forth. And it was in the first person. Which, so it was a little odd to be writing it in the first person with two different writers. And it probably was a little bit schizophrenic uh, first draft. But um, once we started editing it, we both edited it with a very heavy hand. And by the time we had a finished draft, I got to be honest with you, aside from a couple of tells, like phrases that I that slip into my writing sometime that I know were mine or a couple of jokes that I knew were mine. 98% of it. I couldn't tell you if I wrote it or just edited that 
passage. Mm. Um, and so we, what really evolved uh, over the course of the editing was a kind of a third voice, not his voice, not my voice, but this third uh, voice unique to the character. And so that's uh, uh, very so interesting. It, yeah. That, I just had a, just uh, to give me a little nuts and bolts, like he would send you some, some words that the character went through. Did you, were you reactionary? Did you see a path where he would need to go from there? Uh, well, we, we actually mapped out the, the, the book before we started so that we didn't, um, we didn't, uh, go down so we didn't throw curveballs to each other like okay. when, when i was writing when i was writing with jim wilski we had a kind of a funny story you know we had a, a road map you know hey we, these guys are going to look for these diamonds and here's where they find the diamonds if they find them or where they resolve the search anyway and you know maybe it's 20 chapters total let's say about chapter six or so he, he had a scene where his guy found the diamonds and <laughs> I just had to say to him, I remember saying, Jim, we have whiskey tango foxtrot here. I mean, <laughs> now what, you know, this that's is going to be a short I, story. Well, yeah. And I, mm. you know, now I'm, it's a huge curveball. And he was like, yeah, it just seemed like it, it felt good. And it, and it actually did work in the scene. And, and if he was writing the book by himself, I, he probably could have run with it and it would have been great, but it totally tanked a whole lot of stuff that we had already set up. So um, he was like, yeah, my bad. Uh, let's, let's backtrack and, and go with what we already laid out. Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, uh, having, having a roadmap, you, you keeps you from going down, you know, taking side trips that, that throw the other person for a loop. Um, so yeah, Larry would write, you know, a chapter, two chapters, three chapters, whatever it was, he, you know, you take it to this point, he'd send it to me and I would usually go through and do a quick edit on it. And then write my part and then send it back to him. And so we'd rotate back and forth with, you know, edit, you know, review what you just edited of mine and then write my new chapter sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and, and Colin and I do that as well. Um, and, and the result is you end up with, you know, draft 1.5 or 2.0 when you get to the end of the first draft rather than just draft 1.0. Um, and, and, and it works. It works pretty well um, as, as, a, as a process. Well, I, I want to go back to, um, I have to get to the top of your page to get back to the the River City series for a second. Um, actually, let me get let me get here. Uh, I'll ask you a question I've always wanted to ask Larry King. Where the hell do you find the time to write all this stuff? <laughs> well, you know, I, I retired in 2013. Um, I taught um, on the road for... Uh, for the uh, International Association of Chiefs of Police, they had a leadership program that I, I taught for about four years. So I was on the road for two, three weeks a month. So I didn't write a ton during that time period. But uh, at the end of 2017, I, I hung up my PowerPoint clicker and I've been working full time as a writer since then. So, um, you know, I, I, I treated it as my job and I'm not a harsh taskmaster. I don't, you know, refuse, you know, I don't, you, you work Christmas Eve, damn it. You know, I don't, I'm not that, that kind of a boss, but well, how, many, uh, how many hours you know, a day do you think you, do you think you devote to actually writing? Uh, writing, it, it varies, uh, working on the writing related career stuff. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm putting in six, eight, 10 hours a day. Mm. Um, and sometimes on the weekends, if I'm in the middle of a project, um, you know, uh, I, I generally try to get up early and write in the morning when I'm freshest, when I have the, the biggest energy, creative energy, the, the juice is really flowing there, you know, give, give your best self to yourself, that sort of approach. Right. Um, and then do, do editing and marketing in the afternoon and evening. Um, but the nice part about it is being your own boss, you know, I, if I, if I can tell I'm drained and I'm not get, you know, and I'm struggling to to do something to get words on the page or, you know, the editing is, is not flowing or whatever. If I have to take a day off or, or, or change it up, I have all the latitude to, to do that. Hmm. Um, but it's, it's not a job for me in the sense that, you know, I'm punching a clock and I'm looking at that same clock wondering when it's time to, to go home. And I hate my boss and I hate my office. And, you know, I mean, it's, mm. I mean, I've wanted to be a writer since I was a little kid and, and, and now that's what I'm doing full-time. I'm 53 years old. I've been doing it full-time, you know, 
for the last five years and mm -hmm. and uh uh it, so it's a it's a it's a you know labor of love very very literally um and so when i put that time in it, it doesn't necessarily feel like there's no resentment there you know like you might if you were working for someone else and putting in long hours mm -hmm. and the podcast on top of that when you when you are writing do you because your style of writing is very cinematic do you have like a film in your head that you're yeah 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 that's it's it's uh definitely that you you nailed it uh i do see it as a film in my head and uh you know hopefully someday people will see it as a film on their television oh definitely uh, yeah but, i i see that in the, in your future yeah <laughs> well i hope you're clairvoyant then <laughs> yeah. so uh so you have these and i appreciate your time tonight frank and it was oh, extreme, my pleasure right? i found it to be extremely interesting all of the different genres and the and the and the uh the ones you co-wrote with the other uh writers uh you have the seven here um and then you have uh the eighth one of this series i'm talking about the um mm -hmm. river city series mm -hmm. coming out what did you say around august uh, august or september it's a little bit a little bit fluid at the moment but do you have uh, a working title definitely... or do you want to yeah it's it's called the worst kind of truth uh-huh well, before I let you go, I have to ask you, who's doing your book cover designs? They're awesome. Uh, I, I pretty much work with two different cover designers. These are, are Eric Beatner, mm -hmm. the aforementioned uh, Eric Beatner, who, uh, who who does my River City series. If you go back to the novel page, uh, I can I can tell you who's doing the different series because he does these. Um he does the Stefan Copriva series as well, which is a spin-off series. Copriva obviously is a River City police officer in the first couple of books. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, that, that's also Eric. And he just redid that lo lovely dark and deep actually to kind of marry it up a little bit more to the friends of the departed. Um, well, the so one did these, I'm sorry, the one constant in the book, and I didn't mean to interrupt you, but is uh, the book covers is the badge. Is that your badge? That is the shape of a Spokane police badge, an old style Spokane police badge. Uh, it says River City, obviously, instead of Spokane. And the mm -hmm. seal is not the state seal because that is illegal to use mm -hmm. for for commercial purposes. Right. The, actually, that uh, that design, that waterfall design, which really fits the city, was created by um, a publisher in Spokane who was the print publisher for this series uh for a number of years while they were publishing fiction when they got out of the fiction game i i, I republished the books myself but uh he created the seal there um and and uh i think it works really well i mean yeah uh, that's the one constant uh, i saw on the book but i i interrupted you about the designer you, you, uh, well, you so would direct eric, me somewhere uh just yeah, if you slow down just a little bit eric, so eric beatner did the the copriva series there uh just above um he did the, the second two anyway mm -hmm. uh the bricks and cam jobs were done by um uh and of course i'm i'm spacing the guy's name right now because i'm it's the end of the day and i'm losing <laughs> steam uh I'll, I'll think of it here in a, in a minute what well, is it is a um, different style yeah mm -hmm. yeah and he's a he's a great guy he, he he's done a number of, of books now, now this is done by my other designer uh zach mccain who's just a wizard um he he created this battered pulp fiction pulp novel sort of look for this series that i just think is outstanding i like it myself um, yeah and then the troy 316 series so the the guy whose name i'm i'm spacing right now and i'm gonna get it but real quick here he did the first one and then eric uh then uh zach mccain did the, the remaining four in mm. the in the series mm -hmm. um and uh then these are beatners he did these he does my my spoke compton series for those listening uh, to us uh we're, we're at the spoke compton series of his website that you, that i'd like to direct you to after this podcast but go ahead sir uh, that's those are uh, uh eric beatner designs and then um the mccray series uh is another zach mccain 
these were all done the Lawrence Kelter books were all three done by independent contractors that I I reached out to separately I think the middle one there is done by Damon Zaw who's pretty well known in the independent field um, and then the other two were were done by uh, designers that I I just linked up to yeah I didn't mean uh, to put you on the spot by mind. asking you that I, no I, I, I know for most yeah. of them yeah, uh, no, I, I, I just, I, I dug the uh, the covers of, especially, well, oh, I like them all. I like the different styles, but especially like the covers of the River Series um, uh, books. They're very well done, so kudos to that gentleman you mentioned. And well, uh, so now my it. challenge is to read all seven of these before the eighth one comes out and <laughs> in <luck>. august <laughs> are they all well i'm sure they're all full full books yeah but uh i had a very interesting hour it was very nice of you to take your time i don't know what time it is in washington so i know it's getting late here in new york um oh jt or in Oregon. that's uh, that's who it was J the other the other designer i can't believe i couldn't remember his name jt okay. lindrus okay uh, so who's who's living over in europe right now <clears throat> Shout, shout out to all those designers who did an excellent job <laughs> and uh, uh i'm really looking forward to getting deeper involved in your work frank uh I, obviously well, I, 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 I did read the one nove novella and it, you're a very talented writer i like the way you described oh, your style you. as well and um uh, so again uh just look at the show notes whether you are on youtube or spotify or google or apple and uh visit uh frank zafiro.com and you'll see all of these books that we were just discussing and uh thank you so much for your time tonight frank it was quite enjoyable no th thank you thanks for some great questions and letting me rattle on i could talk about writing for four or five hours easily so thanks for, thanks for the opportunity well, that, that's it was our pleasure and uh, we'll see you on netflix soon all of these books especially the river <laughs> series books all right have a great night sir thank you again you too T take care